So now it's my good uh, privilege to introduce Patricia Winter. And let me just say that I've had the, I have the luckiest life in the world. I get to travel and meet all sorts of interesting people. But, but one of the handful of most interesting people that I have ever met is seated right next to me, Patricia Limery. Um, she is, uh, if you haven't had a chance to hear her, you are about to. And her book, The Legacy of Conquest, was a revolutionary book. I mean, literally. Uh, you, can, you can examine American Western studies before and after Patricia Limery's book. It, it caused a stir, it caused great controversy, it changed the nature of the way we see the American West. It's still talked about, um, even though it was published couple of decades ago now. Uh, it's an amazing piece of work, and I, I know we're going to be rushing today, but if you have a chance, and I know that um, Patty would love to sign it for you. She is that most unusual of beings, a MacArthur Fellow. But she has the Genius Prize, among many other things. Genius in quotations, yes. Patricia um, <coughs> Limerick is the faculty director and chair of the board of the prestigious Center of the American West at the University of Colorado where she is also a professor of history. Uh, she's written a number of books. She's one of the most widely sought after speakers in the United States. She's not a Roosevelt scholar. That's exactly why I wanted her to come here, and I'll tell you why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt was a writer. Uh, he, he was the writing his president. Uh, Jimmy Carter, he lives long enough to make a distance. Roosevelt was a writer of books, but so far Roosevelt is the writing of all of our president. By numbers of books, not by sales. Or by quality. They come to the university, then you do this. <laughs> but the reason I wanted Patty to come talk is that I wanted someone, we're talking about the West, and I wanted someone to talk about what Roosevelt considered his magnum opus, his four volume Winning of the West. He brought his reputation as a scholar, intellectual author, and historian to rest on that, that massive study of the early West, the Ohio West. And you, most of us have never read this book, um, but you all, I think, are aware of the notorious passage. So let me just get it on off the table. <coughs> probably have other nominations, but this is, I think, the passage that's reproduced in almost every biography of Roosevelt that looks at this book. He says in volume three, the most ultimately righteous of all wars is a war with savages, though it is apt to be also the most terrible and inhuman. The rude, fierce settler who drives the savage from the land lays all, civiliz all civilized mankind under a debt to him. American and Indian, Boer and Zulu, Cossack and Tartar, New Zealander and Mallorca. In each case, the victor, horrible though many of his deeds are, has laid deep the foundations for the future greatness of the mighty people. The consequences of struggles for territory between civilized nations seem small by comparison. Looked at from the standpoint of the ages, it is of little moment whether the reign is part of Germany or of France, whether the northern Adriatic cities pay homage to the Austrian Kaiser or the Italian king. But it is a calculable that America, Australia, and Siberia should pass out of the hands of their red, black, and yellow aboriginal owners and become the heritage of the dominant world races. That's a tough one, but Dr. Elliot West set the table for this on Thursday night. Now I want the great Patricia Limerick to give us insight. great privilege of having the extraordinary writer John McPhee come to the University of Colorado at Boulder and he would come Thursday night. So I stayed there with him and got in yesterday. Um, so I do apologize for getting here late. I would have loved to have been here. I've had the enviable experience of the last three or four weeks of having the only mind in the United States that had two principal occupants, Theodore Roosevelt and John McPhee. And that 
I recommend it to you as an uh, experience. John McPhee is an astonishing writer. He's written about many, many parts of the planet. Uh, but much of his writing has been about the American West. When I asked John McPhee, I guess this is my point, there may be more in common with Theodore Roosevelt and John McPhee than anyone might think. On Thursday night, I asked John McPhee at the audience uh, if he thought there was anything special about writing about the American West. And now, it seems clear to me, he sounded very Rooseveltian. He said, if I had to choose one place or one region, and I don't want to make that choice, he said, this is why is Roosevelt's interest, but he said, if I had to choose one region to write about, to experience the focus, he said, I would choose the American West. Well, that sounds kind of like Mr. Roosevelt saying, Mr. Roosevelt saying, if I had to choose one place to hold in my memory, it would be the, be the West. So that is the last to say about John and Pete today, but I hope, on the Oakmore tour, if anyone else wants to talk about it, you might love to do that. Um, it is humbling to have such a collection of Theodore Roosevelt experts in the room. I go, I had a moment of empathy with uh, Herman Hagedor getting on the back of that horse. I thought, that's how I have felt for the last few weeks of just going into a room with so many people who are steeped in this. I'm intimidated, but I'm still grateful to Clay because this assignment was extremely interesting and thought provoking, and it gave me a chance to redeem myself from bad behavior, an opportunity that we don't get every day. The bad behavior, although bad behavior was something to have enough of that, so we could be redeemed every day, but that doesn't work out um, in application of time. So the bad behavior uh, that I refer who is widespread in the field of professional history. We are preoccupied as professional historians in keeping up with the field. So we do our best to read the most recent works and interpretations by historians, which means that we rarely, if ever, go back to read the works of older historians, of our predecessors. Isn't that true, Elliot? You're the back there. That's saying Elliot's not. If Elliot shook his head, I'd resign and sit down at this point. But, <laughs> Now that, of course, you're all thinking, that's pretty ironic. People who study the past, who also dismiss or ignore our predecessors, that is ironic, and I think we just have to say, that's ironic. Um, it's not <laughs> great, because there are reasons to read our professional ancestors, and I'm before you today as a uh, demonstration of that, of that truth. First, we avoid reinventing the wheel. We steer clear of claiming discoveries or insights that are not actually particularly original. I would say just one, it's a, a minor point in some ways and a very big point in others. My book, The Legacy of Conquest in 1987, made a very big deal about using the word conquest openly, honestly, forthrightly. I did not think the word frontier was this uh, effective word because, of course, we knew that the South African, that South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, conquered Latin America, we knew those were conquests, and then we chose in an exceptionalist manner here to say that while those conquests occurred, we had had an expanding frontier of opportunity and democracy and so on, which seemed not the group of self-knowledge. So here I am in 1987, oh, big deal, we must say the word conquest. Well, guess who uses the word conquest, frankly, honestly, and forthrightly, in all of the winning of the West? Theodore Roosevelt is my predecessor in that, and it is... Um, just a mark of embarrassment, I will carry that I, in writing the Legacy of Conquest, had never opened Winning in the West, so I had no idea that I was, in fact, in his, his footsteps. And a little bit late to apologize to him, I realized, but um, <laughs> I'm going to accept the apology. I'm, I don't know if but, um, but I think that apology, and if you would make a partial acceptance of it, that would be great. Um, it also allows us to re-examine and monitor our own expectations and assumptions and even stereotypes about the past, and we'll see me doing some of that, um, a lot of that today. And then it gives, an, what I truly did not see coming, it gives the opportunity for unexpected inspiration and a repossessing of neglected and forgotten legacies and inheritance, and even a forging of an alliance that I had no clue that I had. So, I was speaking today of two pieces of historical work by Theodore Roosevelt, the one that I was assigned, Winning in the West, published from 1889 to 1896, four volumes. One reason I think I never tried to read it was that I was under the impression that it was ten volumes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, maybe in retirement there would be an opportunity for that, and I had realized that he actually had planned a much more extensive. Um, I guess I assume this was uh, Crocker, who was writing the bus with me today, Theodore Roosevelt tended to complete what he intended to do. And so it's a, no wonder I thought it was 10 volumes. It might have been 20 or 
uh, its general level of energy. So that's how to say, given the amount of time we have in a day, I was happy to start with only four volumes. Uh, and then I'm also speaking because I'm the vice president of the American Historical Association at this moment, and uh, Mr. Roosevelt was president of the American Historical Association after he was president of the United States, which is so the head spins in thinking about that. I, is there anyone who can name a recent president of the American Historical Association? <laughs> <laughs> I can't, but that's because I'm in those, those circles, so we've had a little drop in visibility. <laughs> Court justices, 
and the justice uh, lifted his hand and rushed the fly away. The little boy was very excited, grabbed his father's arm, shook his arm, and said, Look, look, Dad, did you see that? One of them is alive. <laughs> It is not past its inspirational 
it's, it's, it's expiration season. It's not past its expiration date. It's still capable of not nothing is to expire, but it could be expiring. So that is the fifth framework. And now I want to shift to the topic of discomfort that Clay brought up. There are remarkable statements, generalized statements in this book about the inferiority. Well, it never used the word inferior, but the reasons why the savages of North America deserve to be beaten, and um, no one can be. I'm not going to paraphrase because he does make these big statements about how this is a story of the. Um, destined expansion of the English race merged into the American race of white white folks and that they very rightly displaced Indians. So I expected to find that, that, that quotation, and I did find large generalized statements saying that. Um, so that wasn't a surprise. And yet I will now begin to add what I did not expect, and some of which actually not me. First of all, there is a basic recognition that you cannot understand or write the history of westward expansion without a lot of attention to Indian people. And those are made in very precise statements about how the Indians could not control the outcome, but they could determine the pacing, um, the direction, the places involved in, in westward expansion. So there's a very fourth forceful set of statements about how Indian people are indeed absolutely necessary to the story. Now, I say that just because there are other people who have written, um, like Ray Allen Millington's Western Expansion, the chapter on Indians, confined to one chapter. It was called, the title of the chapter was The Indian Barrier by Expansion. That was it for Indians. That was their only role. It was kind of a uh, police kick line or something set up and then uh, compromised on that. There's so much more attention on Theodore Roosevelt's part to the significant role of Indian people than you can see in those in those later dismissals of Indians. Plus, I was surprised to see quite a bit of curiosity and interest in their customs. Rather than trying to race them onto the battlefield and get rid of them, Roosevelt would linger over the, the various green corn customs that the Creek people pursued, talk about the different housing that the different tribes of uh, the Southeast had. And so it was really, you can see the extraordinary curiosity, just the anthropologist wanting to break free and just own up about those wars. These are interesting people. I just want to write. But you seem to see that at moments, that he's really just so interested in the people, um, just how they lived and how different that was. OK, so that was those two points, that he recognized their, the necessity of having them in a central place in the history of Western expansion. And he was interested in their culture. Those are two things. What I never saw coming, I didn't see those two coming. What I didn't see coming, well, again, my expectation was that he would see Western expansion simply as the path of progress, and he would write in a spirit of wholehearted, unambivalent triumphalism over the progress of the English and American race. His stance, I thought, would be, we won, and indifference to the troubles and injuries to Indian people would be part of that. Wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> really wrong. That's probably, I've made some dumb uh, predictions in the past, but that goes to the top of my achievements in ill-based prediction. Winning of the West, in quite a number of passages, makes a full admission of the brutality and cruelty of white Americans. There is no pulling of his punches when he gets those passages. I'll read a few in a second. He struggled. Theodore Roosevelt, in, this, in these four volumes, you can see him struggling to find a stance and position that would allow him to face up to the violence of Western expansion as committed both by whites and Indians, and not simply Indians against whites and whites against Indians, but also Indians against Indians and whites against, um, against well, at least whites contesting with each other and sometimes actually getting very violent with each other. He made many earnest efforts in those four volumes to deal with this discomfort over the history of white conduct towards Indian people. It was that metaphor, I guess, a burr under the saddle for him. Um, volume one ends with an appendix in which she expresses the hope that someone will write a full history of Indian, Indian white relations, and he asks for it to be broader and more balanced than anything he has seen to that point. It's a, it's a very striking thing. Now, okay, so I just 
describe these remarks generally, but let me, let me give you some examples. Um, here he's just writing of the Creek people in white contrast with the Creeks. The record of our dealings with the Creeks must in many places be unpleasant reading to us, for it shows great wrongdoing on our part. Um, as for the whites themselves, they too have many and grievous sins against their red neighbors for which to answer. This is a, not about the Creeks in particular, but about the broader picture. Uh, whites cannot be severely blamed for trespassing the model is called the Indian's land. For let sentimentalists say what they will, the man who puts the soil to use must of right dispossess the man who does not, or the world comes to a standstill. But then, here's where he goes next. But for many of their other deeds, whites, white settlers' deeds, for many of their other deeds, there could be no pardon. You never told me that. <laughs> that was really. Uh, well, there's, there's many of these, these passages. I'll just read, I'll just read one more. The, uh, the men of lawless, brutal spirit who were found in every community and who flocked to places where the reign of order is lax were able to follow the bent of their inclinations unchecked. They utterly despised the red man. They felt it no crime whatever to cheat him in trading, to rob him of his peltries or horses, to murder him if the fit seized them. Criminals who generally preyed on their neighbors found it easier and perhaps hardly as dangerous to pursue their colleagues at the expense of the redskins. For um, later, when they were discovered, when it was discovered that they had been wrong, whites they were as apt to excuse me, when the Indians discovered that they had been wrong, they were, Indians were as apt to to vent their wrath on some outsider as on the original offender. If they injured a white, if the criminals, the white criminals injured a white, all the whites might make common cause against them. But if these criminals injured a red man, though there were sure to be plenty of whites who disapproved of it, there were apt to be very few indeed whose disapproval took an active shape. So there is a very, very unflinching, direct ways of talking about the sorrows, uh, no, it's not sorrows, but just the actual record of cruelty and brutality on the part of white people and the tolerance of that by white folks who do not take a stand against it. So um, I'll just in the return for a second here to the American Historical Association speech where he says very explicitly, years after writing Money in the West, those who tell the Americans of the future what the Americans of today and yesterday have done will perforce tell much that is unpleasant. Now, we get back to the wrestling and the struggling he undertook. This unmistakably made him uncomfortable. I know I'm, I'm making generalizations. And again, my humility was so many people in the room who could say, that's not what he was doing. And if Wallace Bailey says a word here, I'll just burst into tears if he, uh, <laughs> <laughs> although I wanted to speak to me after this, and I'll do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here are uh, some of the ways in which he justified the record just by the acts of white cruelty and brutality. To some degree, he made some very solid observations that we are now, I think, working our way through as historians of the West. He spoke of the, he wrote of the shifting tribal identities and loyalties, so it was difficult to see who was a combatant, who wasn't, to see which tribe had declared war against the whites and which tribe had simply been caught in them crossfire, that there were factions within tribes that took differing positions on wars. Young men would not necessarily submit to the um, orders of their, of their chiefs. So he explains white brutality in part by saying it was too confusing for the white settlers. They could not, if they killed non-combatants, they didn't know um, in some cases who was who, and they couldn't stand around waiting to say, hi, are you on our side or not? Because that would have been the end of that encounter. Um, and the same he says with uncertain tribal boundaries. You could not tell when you could cross into um, any people's territory because there was certainly no, no clear uh, mark to tell you that. Then uh, he enters some territory that is promising for historical study and historical research but goes, I think, off track and shows how intense and uncomfortable the subject was for him. In some passages, he uses a word that I don't think our people of times would be using now. He talks about the blame. He uses the word blame for episodes of extreme violence. He doesn't say responsibility, origins, causes. He says, yes, how will we ascertain the blame? I, we don't I think, try, try to avoid that. 
Uh, and his answer on the blame question is to say that Indian people had a higher level of cruelty uh, and that exercise of their cruelty, but I'll get back to this in a moment, but that provoked whites to revenge. So he raises a most interesting and valuable idea of the degree to which white Indian conflict was powered by one group injuring the other and then a cycle of vengeance and retaliation starting from that. But this, well, I'll show you in a moment here how that goes a little bit off the track. So. Um, or I've left out one other way, but a very important form of justification that is, of course, for the burr under the saddle thing, this is the best example, he comes back to this over and over and over again, asserting that Indian people had no real ownership of the land. Um, and this, I think you have to see this passage, you don't have to see this, I invite you to see this passage as a person really attempting to convince himself, um, addressing his readers, but in many ways addressing himself. Uh, the Indians, he said, had no ownership of the land in the way in which we understood the terms. The land no more belonged to the Indians than it belonged to Boone and the white hunters who first visited it. How does it get there? It cannot be too often insisted that the Indians did not own the land, or at least that their ownership was merely such as that as claimed by our own white hunters. Well, this is getting a little curious to think these people have been here for centuries and the white hunters have just arrived. And Things are the same. If the Indians really owned Kentucky in 1775, then in 1776 it was the property of Boone and his associates, and to dispossess one party was as great a wrong as to dispossess the other. To recognize the Indian ownership of the limitless prairies and forests of this continent, that is, to consider the dozen squalid savages who hunted at long intervals over a territory of a thousand square miles, to consider them as owning it outright, necessarily implies a similar recognition of the claims of every white hunter, squatter, horse thief, or wandering cattleman. The premise, then, is that Indians were mobile, hunters are mobile, hence equal and substantial claims to the land. Now, this is curious because in other passages, when he's so interested in their culture and way of life, Roosevelt has written about Indians as farmers, not, not wandering hunters. So, there's a person in the room who's not tried that kind of conversation with yourself, where you've taken a public stand and then you're starting to think, I don't know, that makes sense. And you're trying to explain to yourself how you've reached a stand that's actually making you wince. Well, if you are a person in this room who's never had that experience, I don't want to get you to go like that. I want to hear your response. I want to know how you're going to organize your thoughts. Um, so, uh, so, um, I guess I, brother, I just want to give one more example of, of his argument about Indians as intrinsically cruel. Such a war as the war between Indians and whites is, in, is inevitably, and I want to ask you to notice that word, inevitably bloody and cruel, but the inhuman love of cruelty for cruelty's sake marks the red Indian above all other savages. And that made the wars more terrible. So trying to find how uh, making this case for the insubstantiality of Indian title, claiming the cruelty, well, that then he feels, I think I can understand his impulse here, is that he thought he had better make the case for the extraordinary cruelty of Indians. And so this is the only passage I thought in Winning of the West where the rhetoric just goes mad, where the hurry fire of language starts up here. Because it, it's not, there's vivid, lively language, there is not lurid, overwrought language, I think, really, except in this. Uh, maybe one or two other passages. So here is uh, Roosevelt making the case for Indian cruelty and justifying the desire for revenge on the part of whites. The excesses so often committed by the whites, when after many checks and failures they at last grasp victory, are cause for shame and regret. Yet it is only fair to keep in mind the terrible provocations they can endure. Mercy, pity, magnanimity to the fallen could not be expected from the frontiersmen gathered together to war against an Indian tribe. Almost every man of such a band had bitter personal wrongs to avenge. Okay, prepare for rhetoric. Our plane is next for takeoff here when it comes to rhetoric. <laughs> the uh, average set, the regular settler, his friends had been treacherously slain while on messages of peace. 
His house had been burned, his cattle driven off, and all he had in the world destroyed before he knew that war existed and when he felt quite guiltless of all offense. His sweetheart or wife had been carried off, ravished, and was at the moment the slave and concubine of some dirty and brutal Indian warrior. His son, the stay of his house, had been burned at the stake with torments too horrible to mention. His sister, when ransomed and returned to him, had told him of the weary journey through the woods when she carried around her net as horrible a necklace as a horrible necklace, the bloody scouts of her husband and children. Seared into his eyeballs, into his very brain, he bore ever with him, waking or sleeping, the sight of the skin, mutilated, hideous body of the baby who had just grown old enough to recognize him and to crow and laugh when taken in his arms. Such incidents as these were not exceptional. That passage is one of those things where I think if you just took that out of context, you could get back to saying, well, that was a pretty brutal man. But if you put it in the context I'm urging you to think of, that this is a man really wrestling with a very difficult challenge to the human soul. How to put the fact that we live in a state of well-being in this nation and behind us is this making it possible for us to be here, these uh, reciprocal acts of cruelty and brutality. I think that gives us a better feeling for what we're reading. And then I would point out a few passages where uh, where he actually says, you know, here's, here's the passage where I think he shows the balance that he was aiming for and not always achieving in this. Um, uh, okay, every quiet, peaceable settler had either been grievously wronged or had been an eyewitness to wrongs done to his friends. Well, we've got that already. But here he says, and while these were viewed in his mind, these were vivid in his mind, the corresponding wrongs done to the Indians were never brought home to the settler at all. If his son was scalped or his cattle driven off, he could not be expected to remember that perhaps the Indians who did, did the deed had themselves been cheated by a white trader or had lost a relative at the hands of some border ruffian or felt aggrieved because a hundred miles off, some settler had built a cabin on lands they had considered their own. So there he is, I think, at his best moment of saying, um, they could not keep that in their minds, both sides of this. We will keep that in our minds. We will hold that together. What was going on with him with this issue? Why did he not just go into full speed ahead triumphalism? Other people at the time were doing that. Why would he not have joined them? Uh, the answer, I think, in his American Historical Association speech in 1912, why did he not just cheer for the victory? Why did he go to all the trouble to wrestle with this issue? In the speech in 1912, he writes, the greatest historian should also be a great moralist. It is no proof of impartiality to treat wickedness and goodness on the same level. So that's an unusual thing to see, somebody living up to the challenge of his own words there. Other people have written high ground things like that, but then not try to practice it themselves. So, um, the strangest effect, I think, of his discomfort with the violence of the West, Westward expansion, by the way, audiences are just in a state of joy when you see people doing what I'm doing now, which is that I'm moving pages over that I'm not going to use. <laughs> 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 aspect of this, I think, is that he uses the word inevitable when he's really in a pinch trying to figure out what happened, why do white Americans behave so brutally, he will use the word inevitable, he will write the story using the adjective inevitable, the adverb inevitably, the noun inevitability. Is there any word that is less like Theodore Roosevelt? Was there any action he took as president where he's or in, in the action he did not take as president because he said the forces against me are inevitable, I can do nothing about them. So I think that is the measure of a person trying everything he can to deal with that discomfort because inevitable was not his way of thinking. And every, every time you see that on a page of Winning the West, you think, who's here now? Can I see some idea? What's going on here? How did Theodore Roosevelt have used that, that word? Because Theodore Roosevelt was 
really working hard to deal with the conundrum and try and use what he could. So there are generalizations in this book that are not comfortable, that are uh, well, the triumph of the English race, the superiority of the English race, and so on. But the really good news of reading the book for the poor volumes is that the big ideas are not particularly relevant. The stories trump the thesis. Roosevelt was such a narrator, so gifted as a storyteller, that he could not remember to get his damn stories to comply with his big thesis. <laughs> it's a matter of great honor that he let the complicated, troubled, messed up, honorable, dishonorably mixed people of the past, he let them back in for the stories, and the stories drive the book, and it makes you think, well, I guess we're all told to do that. I don't want what they taught people at Harvard in his time, but I'm sure somebody must have said he must have a general idea, a big idea. And he did, he did that, and then he paid almost no attention to it once he got in front. <laughs> so that is an excellent um, response on his part. So I will now um, speak of one particular example. Very tempting to tell more. Okay, so we got big statements there over and over again. Inevitable triumph of the English and American race over the continent. Then we have a story, and I'm just going to tell so many ones that this is also important because it gives an example of the um, effectiveness of the storytelling and the writing. This is a description, the whole long passage is remarkable. The Battle of the Wabash, 1791, St. Clair's, General St. Clair's defeat by the Northwest Indians, and um, well, that's the general general context, and I, just, I will just read the passage, and you just try to put this story into some relationship to the inevitable triumph of the English race. <coughs> David Destin um, And again, it is remarkable to think that he had not been in a military situation himself when he wrote this, which other people kind of know this these books are remarkable. Okay, so the subsection is called Panic Seizes the Army. Uh, this is a very heated contest between Indians who are much more familiar with the terrain than the white soldiers and their officers are. As the officers fell, the soldiers, who at first had stood bravely enough, gradually grew disheartened. No words can paint the hopelessness and horror of such a struggle as that in which they were engaged. They were hemmed in by foes who showed no mercy and whose blows they could in no way return. If they charged, they could not overtake the Indians, and the instant their charge stopped, the Indians came back. If they stood, they were shot down by an unseen enemy, and there was no stronghold, no refuge to which to flee. For two hours or so, the troops kept up a slow, lessening resistance, but by degree, their hearts failed. The wounded had been brought toward the middle of the lines where the baggage and tents were, and an ever-growing population of unwounded men joined them. In vain, the officers tried by encouragement, by jeers, by blows, to drive the men back to the fight. But the men were unnerved. As in all cases where a large number of men are put in imminent peril, whether by shipwreck, plague, fire, or violence, numbers were swayed by a mad panic of utterly selfish fear, and others became numbed and callous or uh, snatched at any atom of gratification during their last moments. Many soldiers crowded around the, crowded around the fires and stood stunned and confounded by the awful calamity. Many broke into the officers' tents and sought for drink or devoured the food which the rightful owners had left when the drums had beaten <coughs> Inevitable conquest of a continent? No. It seems the story, as it's over and over and over the case, the story carries so much more power than any of the generalizations. In the AHA speech, the section that, um, parts that mean the most to me, and I'll close with, are statements that I don't think I have ever heard at a historian's convention, and maybe I was inattentive. I've said it. You get a little tired after some of those H.A. columns. This, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> the moment when a historian has said, and I have said this to my classes, which I think because they're mostly young people, this may or may not be effective, I have said some of these things to the students, and they've looked. I, now I'm going to not say them myself, but quote an important intellectual and leader. I'll see if that does better with them. So here are statements which I believe go to the exact core of the mission of the historians, and yet the core of this mission is so seldom spoken of in these direct terms. 
I will tell you, as a widow myself, I think his, it's just my guess, that his wording here has to come out of the tragic day of his mother's death and his wife's death and his own communication with the reality of death. Um, if he's speaking of the project of great historians who will can now draw on all the research of the drudges who wrote in ways that wouldn't want to read. So he's speaking of the kind of historian who could come along and make something of that. Yet even with these instruments of all this prior work, the historian cannot do as good work as the best of the elder historians unless he has vis vision and imagination, the power to embody ghosts, to put flesh and blood on dry bones, to make dead men living before our eyes. What the historian brings from the charnel house, he must use with such potent wizardry that we shall see the life that was and not the death that is. I wonder if historians don't say this because it makes them cry. <laughs> For remember that the past was life just as much as the present is life. Whether it be Egypt or Mesopotamia or Scandinavia with which this, he deals, the great historian, if the facts permit him, will put before us the men and women as they actually lived so that they shall recognize them for what they were, living beings. The greatest literary historian must of necessity be a master of the science of history, a man who has at his fingertips all the accumulated facts from the treasure house of the dead past. But he must also possess the power to marshal what is dead so that it lives before our eyes and lives again. Theodore Roosevelt in death is the embodiment of the principle he put forward there as in the present, an astonishingly forceful personality. <coughs> Thanks to his astonishingly forceful personality and his extreme quotability, and thanks to the work of so many people in this room, Roosevelt has, on many moments, returned to life. His bravery in taking on the deep moral questions of the Indian Wars is one of the finest features of what he was in life and what he is as the present still very much with us today. Thank you.